church today. Come on. It's so good to have you here, especially yeah, if you're the very yes. first time joining us. My name is Lisa. Come on. My name is John. It is wonderful to be joining together all across the world in venues and homes and online. And if it is your first time, we want you to know that you are really, yeah. really welcome. But we would also love to hear from you. So why don't you send us an email? Write us a message in the chat or just connect with us um, in your venue there with someone on the host team. Yeah, come on, that's so good. Uh, we would also love to invite you to follow us on social media on. to keep up to date with everything that's happening around and across our church and yes. for you to know how you could get involved as well. Yes, and one thing that we love about our church is community. Yeah, come on. We love community because we believe that life is so much more richer mm. when we have somebody uh, traveling alongside us. And one of the days, that, one of the ways that we do that here in Freedom Church is through she and barbarians. So cool. yeah. Yes, and this year she has something very special happening in some of our locations. Yes, our first on. ever Women's Weekend away. It's and for brilliant. everyone going, we know that it's going to be a powerful time for suing God and sisterhood. Come Here's on. a trailer for Dauntless. The lamb was his role. The lion his identity. I may be mother, wife, friend, sister, boss. A role, a title, but who I am? I am a lioness. I am Dorbus. Dauntless, so powerful. Dauntless will be happening in the UK next weekend and in other locations over the next couple of months. Let's be praying for the women attending and for the impact of this time together because we believe that it's going to be so, so powerful and life changing. Yeah, come on, I can't wait. Come on. Whether you have joined us today or you call this your church, another great way to get to know more about the heart of who we are yes. through, is through our DNA. Yes. These are 12 values that describe and define what we believe and the core of who we are. That is true. And today's DNA we want to share with you is raise the next. It says we lovingly disciple, we release leadership, we inspire kingdom influencers and plant new churches. We share the truth and opportunities given to us, changing the world through a legacy of multiplication. Come on, amen. Yes. We believe that the gospel of Jesus changes lives Come and on. we are passionate about equipping others yes, to serve are. communities and people with the love and truth of God. Absolutely. So before we do get to hear a, an amazing what today, we want to invite you to stand with us and let's get on our feet wherever you are. We are going to hand over to the band now to lead us in a time of worship. Let's fix our eyes on who God is and remember what he's done for us as we wash it. Yeah, come on. Excuse me for a minute, but I've got a song to sing. It might not be on key, but it's from my heart. And no one else can tell it or what the Lord has done for me. And this might take all day, so I better start right now. And it might get loud, it might get loud. And heaven's coming down, down, down. And it might get loud, it might get loud. Heaven's coming down.
make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. Lord, turn face toward you and give you peace. Over our church, Lord, over our brothers and sisters, God. The Lord bless you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turns face toward you and give you peace. Let's agree with our prayer today. Sing Amen. generation. I'm going to declare this in every nation and city we gather. Come on, may his favor. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, in your children, in your children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, Children, and the children, and the children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and the children, and the children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, and your family, and your children.
Sometimes we say I promise, but promises can be hard to keep. A promise is so valuable, though we can treat them like they're cheap. A human promise can be silly and be forgotten in a day, but when God makes a promise, there's no taking it away. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father God in heaven. So, when he promises you a 10, he won't be giving you a 7. God has awesome things for us, so much you can't contain it. But don't close the door and sit and wait, we must go out and claim it. God gave the Israelites the land, he always said he would provide. It was there, waiting and ready, but it took them years to walk inside. There are words that God has spoken to you that he seems yet to fulfil. But maybe it's because you need to move rather than stay still. And in case you have forgotten all those promises to claim, here are some to give you faith, and they are yes, in Jesus' name. The morning will find comfort, the humble will be lifted up. You won't lose your reward when you kindly share your cup. The peace of God will guard your mind when it's trial you're walking through. And for those who hope in Jesus, they will find their strength renewed. The world can promise fading things and claim they are the best. But those that unwrap the promises of God discover they are blessed. How you chase the promise and go out and respond will change the very future for the children far beyond. So slay the giant and bravely go with no fear or hesitation. Because it's never just for yourself, but for the future generation. So hello everybody and welcome. Welcome to the final Into the Promise message. And we are excited here in Freedom Hereford today. I don't know where you're joining from. Freedom Cheltenham, give us a hello. Freedom Misanze, give us a hello. You know, if you're tuning in from a fire starter location, we are so, so excited that you're joining us today. We're excited and I hope that you are as well. Hope you're feeling good. And um, I want to start us off by reading the scripture that we're going to begin this message off as we go out and we, as we finish off the final part of this into the promise series, which has been amazing, isn't it? It's been amazing. So we're going to start off with this scripture. We're going to read together. You're going to listen and think, what am I, what am I talking about? But stay with me because we're going to have some fun today, okay? Numbers 32, chapter, uh, no, chapter 32, verses 1 to 5. Put it on the screen. We're going to read it together. It says this, the Reubenites and the Gadites. You've got to remember these two guys, Reuben and Gad, okay? They had very large herds, God bless them, and flocks. And they saw that the lands of Jazer and Gilead were suitable for livestock. I don't know if you have any sheep, but it was suitable for livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the community. And look at what they said. Look at what they said. Next slide. The land that the Lord subdued before the people of Israel, it is suitable for livestock. And so we have livestock. It's a no-brainer. It's suitable. Okay. And, and then on, on to the next slide. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Do not make us cross the Jordan. I've called this message today, heart-shaped glasses. Heart-shaped glasses. And we're going to pray over this message today. Father, I thank you that your word is powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray over this message today that, God, that you minister to our hearts. I thank you that the greatest promise we have received is in you. And yet even beyond that, you desire for us to inherit all that you have given us. So, God, I pray, speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so... I've recently come back from a short family break, and we had a great time. I had a little holiday, you know, and, and I was grateful that we got to do that. We get to do that from time to time, and we, it was a lot of beach. It was a lot of sand. It was a lot of sea. We made a lot of sand castles, and um, I felt like there was a bit of sand castle competition between those that, that, that were looking beyond. But my son, Roman, he he's two, and he didn't really like the sand, and so it was a bit of a nightmare bringing him across the beach because he didn't want to touch it. But then gradually and thankfully, he started to, I guess, loosen up a little bit and enjoy the sand. And we had a great time. It was wonderful. I'm grateful that we got to do it. But one of the things that we got to do in conjunction with our holiday is I've uh, taken a look at this new app, and you'll see it on the screen, called Be Real. 
Now, I don't know if you've heard of Be Real in the country. I, I'm sure they have Be Real in Cyprus. I don't know. But I gave it, I gave it a go. And um, Be Real is basically for everyone that's younger than me. So I feel real out of place. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? And the premise of Be Real is that for everybody, it will pop up a notification on your phone, and you have two minutes to take a picture of whatever you're doing. It's stop, drop, whatever you're doing, take a picture. And I love it. It's just, you've got to be real. It, it, I, I like it. And so if you want some quality content, if, um, if we go back on the, on the other screen, there's a picture of me get it, like, just paying for parking. I mean, if you really want some quality content, that is a load of fun. Um, there's also just me playing, um, you know, with the toys and the animals with my son. And then there's me putting him to bed. You know, it's just really fun content. God bless you. Yeah. But I, 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 like, I like the idea that wherever you are, you can just stop and it cuts through the nonsense of some of this other stuff. And it's, you've got to be real. So I like it. I like it. But one of the things that it does not have, like other social media platforms, is Instagram filters. Yeah, everyone loves an Instagram filter. You can spend a lot of time wasting your time on Instagram filters. So I thought I'd take the liberty of having some fun and just show you some of my Instagram filters. I mean, uh, if, we, if we put up this video on the screen, there's me with a massive head. And I just look really, really stupid and really, really silly. Yeah, here we go. Do you see that one? Isn't that just um, amusing? Here's me with a dog filter. I mean, yeah, there you go. Um, I don't know if you've seen this new sad filter recently. You can literally apply it to wherever you are, and it just looks really, really silly. And then finally, there's me with the heart-shaped glasses. All right. You know, and... I've got to be honest with you, this is the first time that I've ever used the heart-shaped glasses, but I've seen people use it from... T yeah, right, yeah, I use it all the time. Um... <laughs> but I, I mean, I like this idea of, of using these different filters, heart-shaped glasses. But I want to call this message today, heart-shaped glasses. Because we are in the final part of this Into the Promise series. And we believe that we're going to go after all that God has for us. We're going to go and possess. But what I want to put forward to all of us, wherever you are, if you're driving in the car, if you're in a campus, if you're watching this online, I want us to consider today the role that our hearts have in inheriting the promises of God. And that actually, I believe that our hearts can either help us or hinder us in inheriting the promises of God. You see, what we just read here in Numbers 32, the, the passage that we started with, is there are times when you read the Bible and you are ministered to, and it is powerful, and maybe you're having your morning coffee, and you're shedding a tear, and it's like a warm hug, and it's amazing. And there are other times when you're just shocked and at times you're concerned. And this was, this was what happened when I read this passage, ladies and gentlemen. I read it and I was concerned. Because I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert here. Just watch this. Is my conclusion of this passage, if we can put it on the screen, is that not all of the 12 tribes of Israel entered the promised land. Let's think about that for a second. Not all of the tribes of Israel entered the promised land. Now, I've been a church kid for quite a while now, and I've got to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure if I really knew this. And I was reading this, preparing for this message, and I was concerned. I was like, what? Not all of the tribes entered the promised land? I don't know about you, but I think that this is important to know. If we're talking about inheriting the promises of God, these guys were God's people. They were Christians. And yet, not all of them entered into the promised land. So I want to talk about this idea of what this means for us within our own lives. So you can maybe hashtag heart shake glasses. Hashtag in, like, if you've got like an Insta story, you can hashtag heart shake glasses and into the promise. We're going to have loads of fun. But just so that you know, I guess, the premise of what we're talking about is obviously God set his people free, Israel, out of Egypt in a miraculous way. It was incredible. And then they move along and they're now in the desert. They're in the wilderness. And they have an opportunity to inherit the promises of God. But unfortunately, they choose fear over faith. And so they find themselves circling around the desert for almost 40 years. It's not a good time. And so finally, they have their second opportunity. This is their moment to inherit the promises of God. This is it. And so the, the movie starts to crescendo to its eclipse. The, the, the music is starting to increase and get louder. And then suddenly at the back, someone raises his hand and says, I don't want to go. And I'm like, what? 
What do you mean you don't want to go? It's like that family member right before a trip that you're about to go on and they say, can I just go to the toilet? And you're like, no, just get in the car. Just get in the car. And this is where we find ourselves with the Reubenites and with the Gadites. And so they approach Moses with this big idea. And they approach him and say, this is what we want to do. We don't want to cross over into the Jordan. We want to stay where we are. And so Moses, he replies to the Reubenites and the Gadites, a little bit similar to how I just did with you. Look at what Moses says in response. Have a look at this. Moses said to the Gadites and the Reubenites, should your fellow Israelites go to war whilst you sit here? He was a little bit stronger than I was, let's say that. He said, why do you discourage the Israelites from crossing over into the land that the Lord has given them? And then he goes on to explain of why this is concerning. Is He then reminds them of what their ancestors did. Let's look on to the next verse. And he says, because your forefathers, because they did not follow me wholeheartedly, not one of those who are 20 years old or more, when they came out of e- Egypt, will see the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's go on to the next slide. But... And we've heard this throughout the series, haven't we? But Caleb and Joshua, why? They, they were able to inherit the promise. Why? Because they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. So you see this contrast and this comparison. And finally, he takes it a little bit deeper. We're going to be encouraged today, I promise you. But we're going to take it a little bit deeper. This is, this is what he says. And here you are, a brood of sinners, standing in the place of your fathers, we've been here before, and making the Lord even more angry with Israel. If you turn away from following him, um, he will again leave all his people in the wilderness and you will be the cause of their destruction. In other words, he's saying, I can't be doing with another 40 years, guys. Get in the car. (laughs) That's basically what he's saying, right? Now, Reuben and Gad, um, they they have this idea that they want to stay. And so this is Moses' response to them. We're having a little story time here. And um, so what they say is, okay, well, if if this isn't good, then what we'll do is, because we're warriors, we will go and fight with you, but we'll leave our wives, we'll leave our children, and we'll leave our livestock here. We'll go and occupy, we'll go and fight for you. And then when you're done and you've done what you need to do, we're going to go back and dwell within our promised land. And so you ha- you, uh, Moses is like, oh, wow, maybe, yeah, yeah. And so he a- actually comes to the conclusion on this compromise, and he agrees with them. And he says, okay, God bless you, and that's that. And usually it's kind of, that's the end of the story. And if you're anything like me, I've read past this, I've moved past this. But I wanted to bring this scripture, this story to us today. Because I believe that, that actually if we look a little bit deeper, there's something for all of us that we can take away. You know, I've actually read that many commentators celebrated this decision. They congratulated him that it was a wise choice. It was a strategic choice. It was a good idea. But I want to put forward to us today that if we look just a little bit closer of this scenario, that maybe God wants to teach us something when it comes to the journey that we're about to embark on at the end of this series. I think we'll see that actually it wasn't a good idea at all. So if we just conclude what this story is about, the first point that I want you to know so that we're all on the same page is that this promised land was the land that God chose. We want to understand that. This promised land wasn't just some good idea that they came up with, that they chose for themselves. No, no, no. This was the land that God chose for them. This land, your promised land, is a land that is suitable for you. God chose a land that was suitable for his children because he's a good God. But these guys, they chose a land that was suitable for livestock. They chose a land that was interested for something else, something that they possessed. But God's saying, no, 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 I have chosen a land that is suitable for you. Other people say that they preferred the sound of shepherd songs and the trumpet sound of war. That they were more comfortable with where they were at rather than where God was calling them to, to go on to possess. You see, in in Deuteronomy, we don't have it on the screen, but what God said of the promised land was that it was a land full of of good things. He said that it was a land full of uh, of oil vats and vineyards. He said, if you go there, you'll eat and you'll be satisfied. It was a blessed place that God uh, desired for them to go into. It, it It was rich. It was abundant. 
It wasn't a place that was last minute. It wasn't a a place that was depleted or lacking in any way. God's promise for them was good. It was best. It was so good that many other people wanted to be there. But actually what God did, he said, no, I want to set this apart for my children. And it was that same land that Reuben and Gad did not want. It was that land that they did not want. And so I want us to realize that the land that God has chosen for us is a land that that God chooses. But there's something of us needing to embrace fully the places that he has called us to go. What parts of God's promises to you do you need to embrace fully? So number one is that it was a land that God chose. Number two was that compromise, a compromised location led to compromised worship. But you've got to understand the, um, the circumstances and what happened after the decision that they made. We might say, hey, good for you. It was strategic and wise. But actually what they were doing is, is they're saying, we're going to stand on the east side of the Jordan. And as you go into the west side of the Jordan, we're just going to stay here. And, you know, Reuben and Gad, these guys, they were, they were warriors. They were strong and mighty people. They had great experience. God had used them before. And the reason that they had uh, so much livestock was because they were actually the spoils of war. Because they had gone on all of these campaigns, the spoils of war was, that's why they had so much livestock. And so they find themselves and say, hey, we would rather choose this place for our livestock. But as they remained in the east of the Jordan and the, and the rest went to the west, what ends up happening was compromised worship. You see, in those days, God set apart for his children the tabernacle. Because there was pagan and idolatrous worship all around them. He said, I want my children to have a place where they can worship me, where they can be reminded of me, and they can, they can remember what I've done for them. So what he does is he sets up this tabernacle space where all of God's people can come and worship God. But the problem of remaining and settling in the east of Jordan meant was that their their decision now separated them. They were now separated from one another. And and this was a problem because they were worshipping in in different entities. They they were worshipping far away. And it actually says that they set up in Shiloh in Canaan, the tabernacle of God. These guys, Reuben and Gad, they tried to set up their own place to worship. And these guys got concerned in the West. They were like, what are you doing? And it almost starts a civil war. It it was bad. It did not go well. It, It was not a good thing for them. But there was compromise at the heart of their decisions and what they were doing. You see, in Joshua 22, verse 9, this is what it says. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned. So they left where God had desired and intended for them to be. They returned and they departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go and to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession where they were possessed. The problem with the land that they chose wasn't that they possessed it, but that it possessed them. They were so occupied by this land that it actually owned something of them. And what you'll see throughout this entire story is the decision of Reuben and Gad. Reuben and Gad. Reuben and Gad. And then all of a sudden, Joshua 22 verse 9 says, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Who's the half-tribe of Manasseh? Where did they come in? You see, later what they realize is because of the decisions that they made and the influence and the impact of their decisions, later on did they realize that at the very end, somebody else was tagging alongside with them. Who for me is the half-tribe of Manasseh? For me, a half-tribe because the other half went with the West. The other half went to Israel, but the other half stayed. They were influenced by the compromise decision. And so the half tribe of Manasseh, what it represents to me is those who are not yet fully formed. It's half. It's the children. Joshua 22 verse 9, what does the scripture say? The children of Gad, the children of Reuben, the children of Israel. What am I saying? I'm saying that the decisions that we make today will cost our children tomorrow. The decisions that you and I make today will cost our children tomorrow. It can either help them or it can hinder them. You see, Joshua and Caleb were so legacy focused. They were so driven by the blessing for others. Whereas Reuben and Gad, they were just making decisions for themselves and compromised location led to compromised worship. I see this all the time. 
I see the tension in my own life of, man, I would love to do this. Man, this is a blessing. But often, I don't always, if I'm honest with you, I don't always consult God with my decisions and my plans. I think compromise location, compromise, it's things like, hey, do you know what? We're going to choose sports instead of church on Sunday. And today here in the UK and in many nations around the world, it's Father's Day. And if you're watching this, it'll probably be last week is Father's Day around the world. And I want to speak to the men of the house that Joshua said that that me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's something on us as men that will set the course for our families and for our children. And what they did not realize was actually that they compromised something for those that went before them. But for me, the biggest observation, the third point is in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. Many years later, not just in the moment of the here and now, many years later in 1 Chronicles 5, it says, So the God of Israel stirred up the king of Assyria, and who? Not the other, not, not the other seven or, or eight of the tribes. It was Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were taken into exile where they were to this very day. You see, what it's saying is, if we can put it on the screen, number three, is that whilst they were the first placed, they decided where they wanted to go, they were also the first displaced. They were the first displaced. You see, it was God who stood the heart of the king of Assyria. And because of their decision, because they did not wholeheartedly go after all that God had for them, they were left in a vulnerable place. They were outside of community that could fight with them. They were in an environment where they were left vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. And because of their compromise, the enemy was able to take them out quickly. Who were the names? There wasn't any other names, but it was the names who chose to stay in the east of the Jordan. I believe that God wants to unsettle us today so that we do not settle. He wants to unsettle us so that we do not settle. He's saying, where in our hearts have we remained in the east of the Jordan? First place, but then the first displaced. And so for me, this is the idea of the story and what happened as a backdrop. But the bigger issue of what it points to is like we've already talked about, heart-shaped glasses. Heart-shaped glasses. You see, with, with glasses, they become lenses for our lives. I think that our hearts become our lenses for our lives. You can have different filters, different tints on them, can't you? I think that these guys, they were tinted by some things, so it was what they saw. Their hearts informed their sight, and their sight informed their actions, and their actions informed the promises that they were able to inherit. Heart-shaped glasses. It was a lens that they saw their lives through. And God wants to look at the heart in which that we have and the lenses that are there as well because their hearts informed their possession. Their hearts informed their possession. You see, what's staggering is that two out of the 600,000, God rescued 600,000 out of Israel. We're having some fun today. The original 600,000, only two of them, of the original 600,000, inherited the promises of God. What was the factor that they inherited? God said repeatedly, they were wholehearted. They were whole. That was the biggest factor of why they went on to inherit the promises of God. What am I saying? I'm saying that his promises often have conditions. His promises often have conditions. With all that we've heard, even from the cave to the Exodus series, Rosie talked about it in her message. She talked about how promises are like covenants and agreements that we make with God. We need to understand that God has placed promises for us, but they often come with conditions. And I don't know about you, but I think that God can ask that of us. If God, if, if God can do anything, I mean, he wholeheartedly loves us. He wholeheartedly loves you and he wholeheartedly gave his life for you. So I think that in return, God can ask us to wholeheartedly follow him. Promises have conditions. That is why God stirred the heart of the king of Assyria to take Reuben and Gad so that they would learn, will you follow me? Because I desire for you to inherit the fullness of what I have. We've heard right throughout, whether it be Jordan's message about the fear of God, 
You know, Pastor G's been talking about entitlement. Chris talked about the capacity chambers of the promise within us. Dave talked about determination. All of these are conditioned factors to the promise that God has. And let me tell you, the promise is good, but he's also called you to inherit it. But the thing is, is that it's also simple. It's not a to-do list. It is simple that we would follow him wholeheartedly. And so my conclusion, I guess, of this idea is that when I look at this story, those who were half-hearted inherited half the promise. And those who were whole-hearted inherited the whole promise. It's simple, but when we consider it, that's got a powerful ramification on our own life, doesn't it? Wholeheartedness leads to the whole of the promise. Is my heart holy for God? Or is it for other things? Because even then, even then, I'm really laying home on this scripture today. Even then, 200 years after this decision, we're having a little Bible study today, ladies and gentlemen. 200 years, read book of, book of Judges, Judges chapter 5, verse 25. Deborah, the amazing Deborah, the leader that God instated, even she, 200 years later, was referencing the decision to remain in the east of the Jordan. Look at what this scripture says. Why did you stay among the sheep pens? To hear the whistling of the flocks in the districts of Reuben. Why? There was much searching of hearts. What she's saying was, is not only there consequences now that we're, that we're facing because of the decisions that you made, but that also, this wasn't just some sort of occupation, conquering kind of thing. This was deeper. This was about the searching of their heart. And as we round up this Into the Promise series, I want us to look at the, the, the factors of our heart and how our hearts can either help us or hinder us from inheriting the promises of God. It's challenging and it's powerful. You see, if you ever wanted anybody to go on a trip with, you would choose my wife, not me. I've just got to be honest with you. I like the idea of going away. I like the idea of going on holiday. But do not ask me for the details. I have story after story where I've either forgotten something, I left something behind. Last year for the horde, I told all our barbarians it was in a different location to where it really was. <laughs> Father, help us. Oh, my goodness. You know, I'm not a details guy, and I can often forget things. You need my wife for that department. My wife, she organizes and packs weeks in advance. She's asking me months before what I want in my suitcase, and I don't even know what I want for dinner. You know, I am not the person to be asking. For I was the guy who forgot their homework. I was the one who was asking for a pencil or pen from the girls' um, pencil cases from school. I always forgot my shin pads or my school PE kit. And you had to go in your PE kit and it smelt because every people had worn it. I mean, it was gross. I even went uh, mountaineering up Snowdon and it was snowy and we were going up this, um, this, snow, this ice snow face and my cousin had um, these like ice um, axes that you needed to go up with like spikes on your shoes. I literally came with nothing. And so I rock up and say, like, okay, we're going to do this now. He's got two between three of us. We need six. And so we share one each and we're going one handed up the ice like this. And I actually accidentally cut my hand. I mean, it's dangerous. It's like, what the heck is going on? I am not the person that you want for planning your trip, your holiday. But I think that we need to consider what we need to pack. I think that we need to consider what we need for the journey. Be more like my wife, not me. But there are things that we need as we go on to inherit the promises because God has that for us. So what is it that we need? For me, that there were filters, there were tints that these guys had that we need to watch out for. And so the first one is the filter of assumption. There was a filter of assumption. Remember, like we said, not all of the tribes of Israel inherited the promises of God. I believe it's God's desire that we do, but not all did. And I think that assumptions can actually hinder us from inheriting the promises of God. You know, these guys, they were warriors. They had previous experience. They, they had battled. They had fought. They knew what they were doing. And I think that there was something where they assumed that they could just walk into the promised land. Can we be careful? May our experiences set us up, but not actually hinder us and say, hey, I've done my bit for the kingdom. Actually, no, God say, no, there are new frontiers for you to embark on now. So they were warriors, I think, that they assumed. Secondly, they had many spoils. 
They had so much spoils within their hands that it was difficult for them to let go. It reminds me of the rich young ruler. When Jesus said, come and follow me and lay it all down, he went away sad because the wealth and the riches that he held made it difficult for him to pursue. The spoils that were, with, were, were within their hands made it difficult for them to follow God and what he was saying. I think that they made assumptions. I think that we can make assumptions within our own lives. Isn't it easy? Isn't it easy that we can assume that just because it's our preference, it is the promise? Just because, what? Just because it's our preference, it's our promise. I don't think so. Time and time again, I have sought after the preference within my heart. And what God was saying is, actually, I have more for you than that. Just because it's easy does not mean it's the promise. And even we think about compromise. Compromise doesn't mean it's easy. Compromise could be great. It's like, wow, they got all of the livestock, all of the land. It was mountainous. It was fertile. It was amazing. But still, at the end of the day, they compromised. They assumed that their preference was the promise. And I want to put forward today that that's not always the case. Is our hearts submitted to God? So first, they had the filter of assumption. Secondly, they had the filter of agenda. They had a filter of agenda that this was what they wanted to do, and they were going to do it anyway. I mean, come on, Lord, I've been here for 40 years. This land looks good. Please, can we just stop here? It's a pit stop. I'm sure it'll be great. They had an agenda within their hearts. And I do this all the time. I actually plan to speak on something else. And then God said, no, this is my agenda of what I want to talk about today. And it's only when we start to submit our plans of God's will that we start walking out his promises and his purposes. You see, they had an agenda. They went to Moses with what they were going to do. This is what it's going to look like. And then when you read afterwards, look at what they say. Then they say, because this is the Lord's will and because the Lord has blessed it and the Lord is with us and the Lord's favor be on us. But they actually misquoted God. They misquoted God. Actually, the last thing that God said was go into the land of Canaan. They had come so strongly with their own, own agenda that they had twisted the truth and their will and tried to align it to God's will. They had a filter of assumption. They also had a filter of agenda. And then finally, they had a filter of attitude. I think that they had an attitude that actually hindered them from inheriting the promises of God. What did they say in the first scripture that we read do not make us cross the Jordan. <laughs> Do not make us cross the Jordan. Since when was occupying the promise a problem? And I see this in church all the time. They're making us do that. I have to do that again. I can't believe that they asked that of me. And I think that an indication of our hearts is that we make have to statements rather than get to statements. They were making have to statements. Oh, we have to. Don't make us cross the Jordan. Oh, I'm sorry that you have to go into a land that's plentiful, full of milk and honey. They became bitter and they had an attitude. And God said, if I could just turn your hearts, then you would see that I'm a God of immeasurably more. I'm a God who could take you into pastures that you could never go into yourself. I'm a God who's gracious, who's merciful, who's for you. All I want is that you be wholehearted for me. You know, for me, I think a great example of how our hearts have a role in all of this is in athletics and with athletes. When you think about high-performing athletes, they push their bodies and their capacity so far that actually sometimes it's difficult to compare between the two because they are so pushed, they are so at the end of themselves that they are really freaks of nature and just absolutely amazing. But the, the defining difference, the, the differentiating, differentiating factor, if you like, is that actually their hearts. Because your, your, your weight could be the same, your height could be the same, your strength could be the same, but actually it was often their heart that is the differentiating factor. You see, sometimes it's like actually they just pushed that little bit more. Actually, they stood their ground and they stayed standing. Actually, they pushed all the way through into the end. It was actually their heart that is sometimes the defining factor. And so if our hearts are defining factors physically, how much more are our hearts defining factors spiritually? 
And we see this with Joshua and Caleb. It was the defining factor. God said of them, they were wholehearted. God said it of them six times. Wholehearted. Wholehearted. Freedom Rotterdam. Wholehearted. So for me, when God says of wholehearted, Freedom Chennai, I want us to listen to this. Wholehearted. Look at what it, look at what it means on the screen. When God said wholehearted, it wasn't something that they said of themselves. It was something that God said of Caleb. And this is what God said. This is what he meant. He said that he fulfilled to walk behind me. I love that. That God said of Caleb, he was wholehearted. What he meant was, if you look at that word wholehearted, what he's saying is that he fulfilled to walk behind me. And so if you and I want to inherit God's promises within our lives, we need to walk step by step in following Jesus. He fulfilled to walk behind me. It's like he was walking in the shadow of the Most High. And when he turned around, he could see that he had fulfilled to walk behind me. At the end of my days, I don't know about you, but I want God to say, Luke, you fulfilled to walk behind me. Is that our heart and our endeavor as we go out into this series? I believe it's within us and God is pulling it out of us. And so as we close, I want us to consider this. He wholeheartedly followed me. He wholeheartedly followed me. And what I want to put forward to us today is that whilst that this is a heart message, I actually believe it's also a message about fellowship. It's actually a message about fellowship, isn't it? It's about, Lord, I want to go after all of the truth, all of the life that you have for me that comes with following you, Jesus. That whatever you ask of me, wherever you call me to go, whatever you call me to drop down, whatever you call me to pick up, whatever you ask of me, I want to wholeheartedly follow you. And what I want to put forward to us today is that the east of the Jordan and the west of the Jordan Whilst these are geographical, uh, geographical territories, they are actually cardiographical territories. They are areas and territories of the heart. The, the east of the Jordan, what it represents is the unoccupied spaces for God. Unoccupied. But what the west of the Jordan represents is the occupied spaces of God. So what God was saying to Reuben and Gad was saying, not just will you conquer this place, what he's saying, will you allow me to go into those places of your heart and occupy the areas that you don't want me to touch? He's saying, will you walk with me to the west of the Jordan? Will you walk with me through your doubts, through your fears, through your role as a warrior, through the spoils that you have that you need to lay down? Will you walk with me through the identity questions that I'm placing on you? Will you walk with me to the west of the Jordan? God is asked, will we wholeheartedly follow? Because these were territories of the heart. And the beauty of this is the reason why God could say to Caleb that he wholeheartedly followed him. What was God saying? What was he saying? The reason why God could say to Caleb he wholeheartedly followed me was not simply that he was someone who could conquer lands for God. He wasn't just simply saying, do you know, this guy, he's a good guy, he can conquer physically. No. The reason why God said that he could wholeheartedly follow him was because it wasn't just about conquering physically, but that Caleb allowed God to conquer every area of his heart. There was nothing untouched within Caleb. There was nothing. And that was the work that God was doing within him as they went to inherit the promise. I want to invite the band up to play because I want us to respond to this idea. But I believe, I believe that Caleb allowed God to go into the untouched areas of his heart. What he was doing was, was he was working within his heart around patience for 40 years. He was working within his heart around disappointment when his nation turned away when he believed. He was working within his heart when he said, hey, would you be willing to go around this one more time? One more time. One more time. He was working in the areas of his heart. What areas of your heart are still untouched by God? But as we've journeyed through the cave...
as we've journeyed in this Exodus series and God has exposed things to us, as we go on now to inherit and in, into the promise that God has for us, I believe that now is the time where God is saying, go after those areas within your heart because God conquered his heart and then he conquered with Caleb into the promise, but he had to conquer his heart first. So as we close, I want us to go out with a statement. I believe that the church should go out with statements of faith and expectation and belief. This is what I want us to say together of what wholehearted means. Let's put up what wholehearted means. For me, wholehearted means complete. It is all of me. As we make an endeavor to go after Jesus and all that he has for us, it is complete. There's nothing held back. There's nothing off limits. It is all of me in my entirety. God, you get my assumptions. You get my agendas. Heck, you get my actions. You get all of me. All of me is complete. That was the statement for Caleb. Love the Lord with all of your heart. No barters, no bartering, no deals with God. Okay, God, you can have this, but you can't have this. All of me, it is complete. No attitudes. But it's also constant. Constant means for all of my days. All of me, but for all of my days. You see, Caleb, he was steady in his purpose. He was unwavering. He was steadfast. All of his days, no matter what comes my way, I will be wholehearted for him. And finally, thirdly, he was committed. He was committed. And this means no matter what. No matter what. His heart was exclusive for God. No matter what, the good days and the bad. When the nation turns away, no matter what, all of me, for all of my days, no matter what. That is our heart, that is our statement and our declaration. God is saying, will you come after me and follow me wholeheartedly? No matter what, for all of my days. And finally, as we close, I want to read this scripture over us as we go out into the promise. It's in Ephesians 1, verse 8. And I love this. It says, I pray that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened in order that we would know the hope to which He has called us, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. Heart-shaped glasses, that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened and open, that we would see the hope to which He's called us, and that we'd go after the inheritance that He has for us, that our hearts inform the inheritance. I want to speak that over us. I want to speak that over us. And I want us to pray and I want us to respond. I want to hand over to every location in this moment. Wow, heart-shaped glasses. What an amazing and challenging message that was. Thank you so much, Luke Ancon. And we want to encourage you to engage with that message. Uh, not to forget what you've heard today, but engage with it. Talk about it yeah. and see how you can apply it in your life because it is going to change your life. Yeah, come, come on. on. And thank you so much for joining us come today. On. If you are watching on Facebook and you responded or have any questions, please reach out and get in touch in the comments or if you want to get in touch from anywhere else you can email at hello at freedomchurch.cc see on. you next week guys we love you